are you? How are you is this simple question that we ask and answer many times throughout our day, but it's one that left my friend Petra perplexed. Petra was a student I met in college. She was a friend. We were neighbors in the dorms. She was an international student from Germany, and we were hanging out one day. It was probably the second or third week of school, and we were just chatting about, like, what are some of the cultural differences that you're experiencing as an international student from Germany here in the U.S.? This was in Las Vegas. And right away, she answered. She's like, it is so hard to know who wants to be my friend. And so she started to talk about how, like, everywhere I go, people ask me, how are you? How are you? Sometimes they, like, walk by, and they say, how are you? And they don't even stop. It's like no one wants to know how I'm doing, and I don't get it. See, for Petra, she came from a culture where you just wouldn't say that unless you knew someone. But here in the United States, we have this culture of it, how are you? We talked about how, like, how are you is kind of how, like, we say hello sometimes. It's like this polite way of acknowledging someone. But it doesn't always mean you want to know how someone's doing. Have you ever had that awkward moment where someone asks you, how are you? And you actually go a little deeper, and then you realize, like, oh, back up, back up. I'm supposed to say I'm fine. I'm supposed to say I'm fine. As Peter was learning, we have these unwritten rules about how to check in with people, even how to answer how we're doing. And those are fine. Those are, we don't even think about it. It's kind of automatic, especially when life's going okay. How are you? It's like this little dance. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. And we just keep it going, go on our way. But what if you're not good? What if you're not okay? Where do you go when you're just not doing well? Have you ever found yourself struggling to be open about just not being okay? This month, we've been exploring the hard stuff. We've been exploring the spirituality of suffering. We've been pressing into the discomfort of death and finding God in the pain. And today, we continue that. We're going to look at Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is this haunting prayer of someone in the depths of despair, someone who is not okay. And in this psalm, we're given a gift to be able to name our reality, to be able to name what's not okay in us and around us, and to be able to be okay with that. <laughs> the Psalms are a book unlike any other book. Every other book in the Bible are God's word to us through people, through instruction, through the law, through the letters. They're God's words to us. But the Psalms are, are, are people's words to God. They're prayers capturing the tension of life with God. They're joy-filled, they're hope-filled, they're desperate, they're pained. They're real, they're honest, and they're raw. The Psalms are a collection of poems and prayers, and they're often put to music to be sung as a liturgy corporately in community. They're intimate, but they're also collective. It is said to read a poem is to experience what the author experienced. And I think that's the gift of Psalms, that we get to identify, we get to enter in to the lived experience as a community to someone who prayed and put to pen these prayers. Eugene Peterson, who's pastor author, he describes the poetry of the Psalms requires that we deal with the nature of humanity and the prayer of the Psalms requires we deal with God. This God that is determined on nothing less than the total renovation of our lives. I love that. When we hold the reality of our human nature and the grandness of God's redemptive nature, we are free to be honest, both about ourselves, our experiences, and our perspective of God. 
Psalm 22 is a prayer of David's, but it's not David's alone. It's, a, it's vulnerable, it's honest, it's raw, it's pain-filled. And it was a prayer, a psalm, that was set to music and sung as a liturgy in that time. So we're going to do that today. We're going to walk through Psalm 22, and we're going to embrace David's experience. And Psalm 22 begins with something maybe you're familiar with, but it begins with this cry, this guttural cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish. This is a prayer of someone that's in pain. David is crying out to God from a place of deep distress and despair. I looked this up in a different translation. I appreciated the the relatability of this verse in in the um, CEB. It says, my God, my God, why have you left me all alone? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my anguish? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever looked at your circumstance or your life or your past or your future or your present and just said, God, where are you? Have you looked at the world or your checkbook or your calendar and just said, God, where are you? Where are you? I think that's a universal angst to know, to wonder, like, why am I dealing with this alone? David is searing with pain. Now, we don't know the precise historical context of, like, what happened when David was penning this letter, but we know that David, as king and as a person leading up to his time as a king, dealt with struggle, dealt with challenges. He spent many years of his life running for his life from King Saul, fearing for his life, fearing that he would be caught and killed. And as king, he spent time bearing the weight of the oppression of his people, from of enemies within and outside of Israel. And this prayer of David's carries the weight of anguish, the language of like, will it ever be okay? He continues, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults at me, shaking their heads. He's starting to spiral. They, he's, he trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. David is filling in the story in his prayer. He is, he is working out his worst case scenarios. He is wondering where God is, but he knows God is with him. He is wondering if God will ever do anything, but he knows God is sovereign. I think Psalm 22 gives us this permission. It models this invitation to bring our honest experience to God. I want to share a little bit of like how I've experienced this in my own life. I think, um, so if, uh, before, I have two boys, before we had kids, um, before we had Everett and Grant, my husband and I had two miscarriages, and I had um, just experienced my second pregnancy loss, um, one that ended around 12 weeks, and I ended up having to have emergency surgery, and it was a traumatic, traumatic experience. I was grieving, I was angry, I was sad, I was missing a baby we never got to meet, and I was heartbroken, and I was so angry. I was so angry at God. I was angry at myself. I was angry at everybody, at the person like serving me coffee at the cafe shop, you know, like I was angry at everybody. The person that just cut me out, like, why is this world the way it is? Why do these things have to happen? 
My anger was like this rock that I had swallowed and it just sat in my stomach. I felt the weight of it, but it didn't go anywhere. I wasn't able to process it. It just sat there and it affected the way that I interact with the world. And I was in counseling at the time and I, I was invited by my counselor to give myself permission to be angry. See, I tried to hide the rock. I tried to pretend I was okay. I tried to say, I'm fine, I'm fine. But I wasn't fine. I was mad. And I was feeling hopeless. And so my, my, I worked out this plan that every day I would drop my husband off at work. We shared a car. So I'd drive across town, drop him off at work. And then I'd go to a coffee shop next to it, his work. And I told myself, <clears throat> the second I sit down till the second I get up, I get to feel anything. I get to be mad. I get to be angry. I get to shake my fist at God and say, why? And other things. <laughs> I get to be honest. And we think, like, we're praying, of course we can be honest, but there's this thing in our culture that just pushes us to say, like, I'm fine. There's this, like, we don't want to be a burden, or we, this, like, toxic positivity, or just pushing through and getting through something. But there is something really sacred about this opportunity to sit down and say, I'm not okay. My rage became my prayers. I told God what I thought, I vented, I cried, I asked questions. I gave ideas of how I thought things should go. And I remember leaving, I don't know when, like, I don't know the day or the moment things shifted for me, but I remember there was this moment where I said, I don't know a lot of things. I don't know why things happen. I don't know why there's suffering in the world, but I know somehow God is with me. I know somehow God is good despite the things we see and the things we experience. And I know that God is trustworthy, even though I'm so angry right now. And somehow, as if naming my reality, facing God with my anger, somehow that practice helped me not get swallowed by it. I remember one, after, one evening, Daniel and I were at a dinner at a friend's house, just kind of checking in a, couple, a month later after this had happened, and we hadn't really talked to anybody about it. And I just remember it was our turn to share, like, how are you? How was your summer? And I just tried. I started to share, and then I broke, and I wept, and we cried, and our, our friends just kind of carried our grief with us. As I navigated the, the depths of my own anguish, I discovered and still I'm discovering the transformative power of honesty and vulnerability in prayer. Author Ronald Rollheiser, he's a, um, wrote a book that, The Holy Longing, and in it he shares this quote I'd like to share with you. Unless we mourn properly our hurts, our losses, life's unfairness, our shattered dreams, our radical and consummation and all the life that we once had, but now that has passed by, by, passed us by, we will either live in unhealthy fantasy or ever intensifying bitterness. Lament invites us to mourn our losses. What are you in need of mourning? What losses or hurts are you holding on to? In Psalm 29, there's a shift in David's prayer. He begins, yet. He turns his anguish to what he knows to be true. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. Even my mother's breast from birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. And then he offers a plea. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there was no one to help. 
David was someone who knew God. He was someone described as someone after God's own heart. He knew God's covenant promise that God would never abandon his people. And yet David's anguish was visceral. His despair, the fear, the isolation, the intensity of not seeing God making a way, not seeing God's intervention. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and feet. All my bones are on display. People start and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them. They cast lots for my garments. Hundreds of years later, David's prayer would find fulfillment in Jesus. When Jesus has a crown of thorns pressed into his head, when his clothes are divided, when he's mocked, when he's beaten, and ultimately when he's crucified on a cross, the most humiliating way possible known to the Roman world. Jesus, when he was on the cross in Matthew 27 says, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, Lama Sahbatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Author, teacher on the Psalms, Christopher Ash, he says, Jesus cries these words on the cross not because he couldn't think of any way of expressing his pain, but because all his life, this Psalm, Psalm 22, the Psalms had shaped his prayers. These prayers of lament had, ga- had given them language and space to, to grief corporately, to shape a culture of lament and suffering as worship to the one who would bear it all. Jesus' agonizing cry on the cross echoed David's lament, crying out in solidarity, not because Jesus thought like, God, you have abandoned me, or God, where are you in this moment? But because he was experiencing solidarity with our human suffering. Jesus knew his purpose on the cross, to bear the weight of humanity's suffering. Jesus could have said, I got this, just wait, you know, it's almost coming. But there's something really powerful when we enter in to someone's suffering and grief and even anger. Psalm 22 teaches us to both pour our heart out to God and to trust God at the same time, that those two things don't cancel each other out. These are prayers of lament. About a year into the pandemic, I was like quarantined at home with kids working, my husband was working and it was crazy chaos. And I had already been in this rhythm with a couple of friends, Melissa and Mandy. We had been co-workers that had kind of eventually ended up in different states and cities. But we had gotten into this habit of Zooming every week, every other week and checking in on each other. And so when life got hard, When things got heavy, we had already cultivated this practice of connecting, checking in, praying together for each other. We had navigated, one of my friends had lost a parent, one had lost a child, we had navigated health stuff, um, grief, just kind of collective grief in our culture, and it was so much. And one of my friends, I think Melissa, she had the idea of like, let's write a lament. Let's take this practice from the Psalms, this invitation from the Psalms, and, and let's try it. And so we kind of went off and we said, the next time we come back, we'll share our lament. And it was really uncomfortable. I didn't know how to be honest. Like, how honest did I want to be? Could I really be honest and lament and grieve the things I was experiencing? but I knew that there's freedom in lament. And so we did. We each brought our our written prayer 
that named our realities, that identified our pain points, that shook our fists in anger, and yet recognized this invitation to trust despite a reality. And it was powerful. It was really powerful, both offering and stewarding these prayers of lament. And I think that's the gift that Psalm 22 offers us, this opportunity to hold in community the burdens of life, of suffering, of the world around us in prayer and in trust. And I want to move us into a practice. Now, I won't <laughs> have you share and we won't, hold, we won't do this, but I invite you. This might be a great opportunity for someone that you have a close relationship where you can go deeper and you have the time. But I want to give us a taste of Psalm 22 in a form of practice, spiritual practice. And I want you to think about what are the things that burden you? And this is a heavy question, and so I want to give us a lot of space to kind of peel back the layers that invite us to like actually get to the core of what we carry, to, give, to invite us to bring our whole self to God in prayer, and to consider like what is weighing on my heart? What sorrows, your own or other, the world, what are you carrying? Where does grief reside? And then to invite us to give that to God, to offer it in the form of a question, in the form of a circumstance, to offer it in the form of a forgotten dream or uncertain future or even just the numbness of not knowing how to tap into that area of our lives, of our hearts. And then, not as a way to put a pretty little bow and to say like, things will be okay, but as a as a discipline of trust to say, despite all the evidence that tells me I should have no hope, and yet, what's the invitation that God has for you to hold on to? I want to share an image, and then I want to move us into just a time of listening. And I thought about giving us, like, paper to write. It's helpful. You peek, put it in your pocket, look at it. But I feel like, actually, to to give you the, com like the freedom, the permission, and even the vulnerability to just be totally honest, I just invite you to think this in your mind, in your heart, to be able to say, like, to speak the unspeakable to the Lord and to let the Lord speak to you. I want to offer this image. So a little while ago, okay, so I have two kids now, and... I am very sound sensitive. <laughs> and so the sound of my kids crying, although I know there's this part of me that just wants to nurture and be present and loving, it's like so hard for me. And so I had heard this tip and it actually has been really interesting in the ways that it shaped both my kids and myself. But I heard this tip that like, when you're uncomfortable and you've got someone crying, a kid that's crying and you don't know what's going on, you don't know how to make it better, stop resisting the tears. Stop trying to shut down the grief or the sadness and invite it. And so, I, you know, my kid would run to me and say, instead of saying like, it's okay, it's okay, it will be better. It's okay, you're okay. Just say, go ahead and cry. It's okay, you can cry. That's so hard, you can cry. And what I noticed is that some of the time my kids would actually stop crying. It was like almost as if they knew that they had permission, they knew that they could be safe. 
and they knew that they could be free to feel what they felt, it kind of made it that source of tension lessen. And I noticed that I actually, the more that I could name, like, it is okay to cry, it helped me know, like, it is okay to cry. It is okay to be mad. They took your toy, yes, that's okay. You don't have to say I'm fine. You can feel sad. And I think for some of us, the prayers offer us this gift that it is okay to not be okay. It is okay to cry. It is okay to be angry and to know that God is with you in that. So let's move into a time. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come and strum and, and give us an environment to reflect. It's not awkward, you know. Um, I know, we'll invite the worship team to come up. And I wanna just invite us into a time of listening. Of listening to the things that are within us that just feel not okay. And it could be that you're at this place where things are going okay, but as you sit and you think about the world that we live in, or you think about the ways you, you lament sideways and you think about the suffering of your friends or loved ones, you can carry that. You can carry their weight into prayer. And maybe you're not okay and you're here, you're just like, I made it here, it's good enough, right? And maybe this is an opportunity to actually voice, like, what is not okay? What is the thing that is crushing you right now? What is the dream that you hold on to and you're like, am I ever going to see fulfillment in this? Am I ever going to see something unlock in my life? Maybe it's the heartbreak of loss or the heartbreak of strained relationships and you think, there's no way this is ever gonna get any better. And lament doesn't answer, will it get better? It gives us permission to say, to ask, God, where are you in this? And then to hear God's voice meet us in the silence, in the stillness, in the pain. So let's go ahead and take a few minutes and, and in a few minutes, I will bring us back to go into a time of worship and communion. But I want you to listen to two things. I want you to take a deep breath, to slow your mind, to slow your body, and to say, what am I carrying? What am I carrying in my world? What am I carrying in the world? And then I want you to invite you, what is the truth of God that God wants to speak to you to hold on to in light of that reality? Take a few minutes and then I will move us into a corporate time of this prayer.
lead us through this prayer and as I do I will like read the prompt and then I'll just leave a little silence for you to talk to God for you to lament to God for you to just to ask lament invites us to cry our hearts out to the one who sees and knows and embraces us in our suffering. My God, my God, why? What's a truth that God wants you to hold on to? And, <laughs> and yet, and yet. Invite us into a time of worship and communion and an opportunity to respond to how we sense God meeting us this morning. Before we go into our week, let's take some time to sing songs to God, to, to respond, to reflect, to stand, to sit, to worship. There's opportunity to, for prayer, for someone to sit in solidarity with you in, in your suffering and to to plead on your behalf. Prayer team is available and they'll just ask you, how can I pray for you? And invite God into whatever it is that's going on in your life, big or small. God wants to meet us in our circumstances. And we can expect and trust that he will. And we have communion in the back. And if you're new to communion, communion is where we, we reflect and we receive the gift of Jesus' death and resurrection. And as we move into this time of worship, into of communion and prayer, I wonder for those of us who are kind of like holding it in and, and trying to push through and really, really like just trying to do our best. I wonder if there's an opportunity or an invitation to let someone hold that with you. 
And I wonder for some of you who are just like going through the motions, but just feel like if I'm honest, I've lost all hope. I don't know that tomorrow can be any different than today. And I wonder how lament invites you both permission and an invitation to meet God in that, in that place and to let God be the hope. Let God transform your reality, even if it's just as you carry it. Maybe some of you just need to hear from God. You just need to hear that the one who, who grieved the weight of suffering can actually receive our circumstances. So let's stand, let me pray, and we'll move into a time of worship and communion.